we are in our fourth night of the basic series. You ask the questions, we give the answers. And this is um, about four different questions. I'm going to add them all into one. A lot of people ask this. It's about dreams. Not like go to sleep dreams, but just dreams. A lot of people say, how do I realize what dream God has for me? A lot of people said, how do I achieve my dream? A lot of people said, can I honestly achieve the dream that God has given me? So add all those questions into this. Here we go. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this night. Thank you for all of these wonderful young college age, 20s, young adults, Lord God. And I pray that tonight that this word just radically changes their life forever. We are so in love with you, God, and we thank you. And Lord, I pray that each and every one of us have a desire to reach every single vision and dream that you ever give us. In your mighty name, amen. So here is the deal. We're going to start off like this. God does not call the equipped. He equips the people that he calls. If you've never had a dream that God has given you that scared you 100% absolutely to death, you've never had a God dream. Many dreams that the Lord has given me, I was like, you sent the wrong dream to the wrong address. There is no way I can do that. Then the Lord already speaks to you and says, I know, that's why you got to rely on me to, to fulfill the dream. Because if I gave you a dream that you could fulfill on yourself, then you wouldn't need me to do it. Then it wouldn't really be a God dream, right? It would just be a man-made dream, then it would just end up horrible. So there are six things that you're going to have if you have a dream. The first one is you're going to actually have the dream. God gives you a dream. He gives you an idea. He gives you a goal. He gives you ambition. The scripture for this is God is able to do far more than you would ever dare to ask or even dream. And think about this. Has the Lord ever spoken to your heart and given you something to do, and it scared you to death, and it was so big that you ran away from it? As 71% of the people go like this, tonight is the night that we re-engage on the dream that God has given you. So many times I've heard people say, Pastor Joe, I need a word. I need to find out what God wants me to do. What can I do? And then I tell them, well, what is the last thing he told you to do? Oh, my gosh, that was way too big for me. I said, no, that was for you. That's what you need to do. If you're wanting a word from God, think of the last thing that he told you to do. And 99.99% .99 of the times you haven't completed that, go back to it. It's kind of like if I tell my kids, Malachi Judah, clean your room, and they start playing. If they come back and say, what do you want me to do? I want you to clean your room. But they don't do that because they usually mine a lot of times. So the thing is when God gives you a dream, it's for you to think about it. And the thing is if the Lord gives you a dream, you're not going to be able to do it overnight. You're probably not going to be able to do it in the next four or five months or six years. The second thing is a decision. When God gives you a dream, are you going to decide to do it or not? And that's the big thing. And a dream is, is worthless until you decide to do something about it. And I'm challenging you tonight. So many people in here, you have a dream laying deep down inside of you. And it's dormant. And in Jesus' name, we're calling those dreams forth tonight that they're going to come back to life. Amen? The scripture for that is James 1 and 6. It says, you must believe and have no doubt. A double-minded man is unstable in all that he does. Three is a delay. We don't like the delays. The thing is, whenever the Lord gives you a dream, you get excited, you get motivated, you run after the dream, and then it's like nothing works. And it's like a huge delay period. And you're just kind of frozen. And you're like, man, what, what is going on? That's where faith comes in. Number four. Let's go back and read a scripture for this. This is the back of two and three. I'll get to it later. Number four, a difficulty. Now the problems start popping up in everything that you've ever wanted to do. There is nothing easy about a God-sized dream. But don't worry. It's all part of God's plan. It's easier said than when you're walking through it. But walk through it. A scripture for this is Peter 1, 6 through 7. There is no accident. It happens, it happens to prove your faith. So be ready and stand fast in what God has called you to. This is the worst one. Phase 5, a dead end. This is where a lot of people stop. It says your, your situations will deteriorate before your eyes. Everything seems difficult. Everything seems impossible. You are backed into a corner. You're against the rope. You're ready to walk away, and you're ready to give up. Congratulations. Your dream's about to happen. And a lot of times when people call and they're crying and, and they're at their, their wit's end, God told them to go to college for four years. They've got the first six weeks done. They have no money. They have no job. They're not going to be able to do it. They can't pass a single class. I'm like, welcome to the real world. Here we go. And it's all good because God's given you a dream. And, you know, nothing worth having comes easy. Nothing. A scripture like this, it says 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9. At the time when everything is completely overwhelming, in fact, we tell ourselves this is the end. 
yet now we can believe that we've got a sense and a, a dependency and urgency to depend on God, not in ourselves, but in God, and He will raise His dream from the dead. And, and point six, a deliverance. God provides a supernatural answer. Miraculously, things just seem to fall into place. God turns everything around in your situation. Psalms 27, 13. I expected the Lord to deliver me at once and see the goodness of God. Now we're going to get into the Word. Are y'all excited about this? I promise you should be taking notes. This will change your life forever. Man, when you talk about dreams, think about this. Jesus Christ himself had to wait for 30 years before he could, you know, step into the ministry that God had him. But, you know, also you think about in Jewish customs, you weren't allowed to speak in public until you were 30 years old. And, and Jesus sat there preparing himself for, for 30 years. But has God ever given you a vision or a dream and it motivated you and it captivated you? And then you were in a hurry, but God wasn't. Why is that? Because you're on God's time. You're not on your time. You know, I have no patience, and I never really pray for it either. And it's just like I want everything now. I want everything to happen now. But, but the thing is, sometimes I have to wait. You know, a lot of times we're ready, but God isn't. But God wants to work on you before that. So if God has called you to something great, and, and you're here and the dream is over here, we worry about what? The end product. God worries about the process and the things that he can do in you and the things that he's going to do through you. I'm going to talk about some people in the Bible here. Noah waited 120 years from the time he started building the ark until it started to rain. 120 years. Patience. Dear God. Right there, he started building this ark. Everybody, It said the people in generations never even seen rain. And they're like, this dude is an idiot. And he's building and building and building for 120 years. Abraham was told that he was the father of great nations. And he didn't even have a child till he was 99. And then he had the child. And God said, Abraham, you slept with the wrong woman. And so it was his handmaiden. And then so he had to go back and have a legitimate child and not an illegitimate child. And so he didn't have the, the child he was supposed to. He was 100. You know, you know God told Moses that I want you to be the, the leader over some people who've been in bondage for 400 years. But then he made them walk in the desert for 40 years before he fulfilled it. You know, and the one I'm going to camp on for a minute is Joseph. And I want to talk about some things about Joseph. Joseph, first of all, was the favorite son of his father. And one day the Bible says that his father came out with a coat of many colors. Now, you don't go to Dillard's back in the day and get a coat. You got to sew that. You got to go kill a bunch of animals with 19 different colors of fur. And you got to make this nice coat. So he gets this coat and he walks down. All of his older brothers are looking at him thinking, well, this isn't right. First of all, you got to understand something in life. This Favor ain't fair. There's a lot of people that walk in the favor of God, and people would dislike you for the favor that you have in your life. Things just seem to drop on you. Life comes easy. You get blessings. You get placed in high positions that you didn't even earn. You get things that you didn't even work for, and things just come up on you. Don't ever get cocky and arrogant because you've done nothing for it. That's the favor of God. And when God gives you favor, you use everything for the Lord because it says in James that every good and perfect gift comes from where? Above. So, or the Lord. Good answer, Blaine. And the thing is that he was sitting there and his brothers didn't like him. And one night he came out and said, hey, everybody, come here. I had a dream. Now, he was 17 years old. And he said, this is what my dream was. He said, I, the dream that I had, I was binding sheaves of grain in the field together. And suddenly the sheaf rose and it stood upright. And all the sheaves gathered around all of them and they bowed down to me, which basically meant everybody around me, you bow down to me. And they're like, hang on, you're 17. We're in our 20s and 30s. Why in the world would us being your older brothers and all of our family bow down to you? So he's got his coat. They didn't have coats, especially with 19 different animals on them, you know. And that's not biblical. I made that up, by the way. And so he's sitting there, and they're like, you know, why are you telling us this? You're saying you're better than us? And he's got the favor, and he's heard this dream. Well, one thing you need to learn is you need to watch who you tell your dreams to. Because if you start telling your dreams to some people that don't have the favor on their life and God's not called them to do what he's called you to, they think that you're bragging and hatred can set up in your heart towards you. And people that love you can dislike you. You know, the Bible says we have to love everybody, but the Bible didn't say we had to like everybody. Amen? I like most of you. And the thing is, that so his brothers were resenting him. And then to make things even better, he came back and said, I had another dream. 
And in this time, I, I had a dream that the sun and the moon and the eleven stars bowed down to me. It was his parents and his brothers. The sun and the moon was his parents, and eleven stars was his brothers. And he's like, so y'all going to bow down to me. They really got, you know, discouraged then. But then they had a, an idea. Let's all go on a camping trip. So they went on a, this big trip, and they sold their brother into slavery. Such hatred entered into, entered into their heart that they sold their very brother into slavery. Where in the Bible did it say for Joseph to tell everybody his dream? It never did. Sometimes you got to keep your dream to yourself. you got to keep things to yourself, and you need to sit on them for a minute. You need to focus. So this guy ended up fulfilling what God had for him, but it was 20 years later, and he went through prison, and he just had a, a, a really rough life after that. But the thing was, he was bragging about everything that the Lord gave him. And every time somebody gave him something, he would flaunt it. You need to hold dear to the, the blessings that the Lord has given you. Because I promise you another thing. There's people out there called dream robbers. And it happens. I remember one time I was at a church and I had a, a fundraiser from the Lord. And I ran in and I told some people this fundraiser. I'm going to raise so much money for the youth. And we're going to be able to do so many great things. And the next week. Another group had my fundraiser of the Lord. And I was just like, you got to be kidding me. You know, not everybody's sanctified in the church, by the way. And, and I was upset, and I was like, I cannot believe that. And my pastor said, well, who did you tell? <laughs> he just laughed and said, Joe, come on, you're smarter than that. I am now. Um, <laughs> but you have to learn who you tell your dreams to. I've had dreams about 20s ministry that I've told other 20s groups. And you know what? They went and did it before I did it, and they didn't succeed. You know why? Because the grace wasn't upon them. When God gives me a vision, it's to give a grace. You know, if God gave some of you a vision to do some sort of ministry, if you told somebody else and they did it, they might not be able to fulfill it because a lot of times you're working in man's power when God's power is not upon it because it's grace. Because when God gives you a vision and a dream, you're to do it. This is what I hate, so please don't do this. Pastor Joe, I had a word from the Lord. I said, what is it? I, I think that we should do this type of ministry. And they go into all of these details, and then they give it to me. And then they walk off. And I'm like, where are you going? Well, I, I submitted it to you. I said, well, when are you going to start it? Well, I'm not doing it. I said, well, why did the Lord give it to you? I hear from God. I just talked to him a while ago. Before he walked in, well, he would have told me if he wanted me to do it, if he wanted you to do it. Well, I'm not going to do it. And the thing that is so sad when that happens because God gives people visions and, and dreams for a reason. It's to complete the call that he has for your, your life. I had the privilege um, actually last week to sit down with the 20s pastor of from Gateway Church in Dallas. And as we were talking, he said, Joe, here's one thing I want you to always remember. He said, every vision and dream God gives you, you're held accountable for that. And I thought, oh, Lord, I'm in trouble. And I've got so many visions and dreams typed in on notes on my iPhone in my head, just on paper, on sticky notes, that I haven't completed. And, you know, so i got to get busy doing that. A lot of you, God's given you a vision and a dream about something to start. And you know what? You need to start it. The next one was, you know, God anointed David as the king, but he wasn't the king for years later. He served the king. Man, I remember one time the Lord spoke to my heart and said, you are the next youth pastor at First Assembly of God. And I said two things. I said, God, they have a youth pastor. Second of all, I can't stand teenagers. And then a few months later, I heard an announcement from a pastor, our youth pastor is leaving. And it's like the Lord's like, told you so. And so, but the Lord said, don't ever tell anybody. They tried youth pastor after youth pastor. They've been to, to seminary. They've been to cemetery. They've been to everywhere. These guys were coming in one after another. They were preaching and trying out for the youth pastor position. And I was just sitting there. I was, you know, just hanging out in church. And the Lord just kept saying, don't ever say anything. It's, it's going to come to pass. And one day they called and said, hey, do you want to, you know, be the youth pastor? I said, sure. We'll, we'll give it a whirl. See what happens. And then the next time I looked at that youth group, my heart fell in love with them because God changed everything about me. And, you know, it's just like this. It was, it was a lot later after the Lord spoke that to my heart that things started to happen. Amen? All right. We're going to talk about dreams now. I hope you got one. If you, if you don't, we're going to get one. I promise you this. A delay is not a denial. And this is what happens. A lot of people, you get caught up in a not yet, and you think it's a no. You're ready to do something for God, and God's giving you a vision and a dream, but nothing's happening. And in your, your, your mind, you're thinking the Lord's saying no, no, but he's not. He's saying not yet. Hang on. Wait a minute. 
you know, we got some hunters in here. You ever seen that big buck walking and you got your gun and he's like 150 yards, 125 yards, 100 yards, and you're, and you're you know, you get buck fever, getting crazy, getting trigger happy, and all of a sudden you wait till it gets closer and closer and you probably still miss him. But <laughs> it's good. Brent wouldn't though. Brent would nail him. But you know, hey, check this out. You know, how many of you ever said this? There must be more to life than this. If you catch yourself saying this, chances are you're not living your God-given life and you're not walking in your God-given purpose. And how many of you ever said that? Don't raise your hands. But how many of you ever just sit there and say, God, there's more to life than this? There is. I promise you. You know, and catch this. Habakkuk 2 and 2 says this. This is why I'm so big on notes. I don't think I have a lot of good things to say sometimes, but when you quote the Word of God, you know some of the biggest words I've ever received from the Lord in my life was radically changed is when a preacher's up there preaching, the presence of God's around, and the Lord speaks something in my heart that has nothing to do with the message. And I just started writing it down, and the preacher probably thought I was writing down. I mean, I was at a conference probably about three months ago, and a guy was speaking. I don't even know what he was speaking about, but I'm sure it was good. And, and the Lord spoke to my heart about something that just changed my life. And I wrote it down, and as I was leaving, one of the pastors said, well, how, did you get anything from the session? And I'm like, I sure did. It was awesome. It had nothing to do with what they're saying. But the presence of God was in this, so the Lord was speaking. So Habakkuk 2 and 2, it says this, Write the vision down and make it plain on tablet, that he who reads it may run, for the vision is yet set for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it, because it will surely come. It will not tarry. So what this basically says is whenever you get a vision, you write it down. Put it on a sticky pad. Put it on one of these. Man, I have these all over my desk. I have them in my car. I have them everywhere. And I sit there and I read them. And I look and I say, hey, this is what the Lord said. This is what the Lord said. Because if the Lord spoke something to you and you don't write it down, you're going to forget it. And you got to write this stuff down. you got to write it in your computer. I've got some stuff in my computer. It's just like old words. And I just start going through it. And I just start reading it. And I just start encouraging myself to the things that the Lord has spoken in my life. You know, and it says that the vision is set for an appointed time. There's a time, God's timing on it. And it says, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. Even though it tarries, wait for it. How many like waiting? Nobody. But it's going to happen. And then it says, because it will surely come. And when it comes, you need to be ready. This is, this is a thought. Whenever God gives you a vision, you say, am I ready to do that vision right now? And if the answer is no, you do everything you can to get yourself ready for that vision. You do whatever studying you need to do, whatever you need to do to get yourself prepared. And another thing, when God gives you a vision, we're shifting here. Whenever God gives you a vision, you need to get around successful people, whatever the vision is for. If God called you to be a pastor, you get around successful pastors. If God called you to go in the army, you need to get around people that's been in the army. You need to get around people that's retired from the army. You need to get around different types of people. I like to get around people generationally. If God calls you to something, get around somebody that's in that field that's in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. Get somebody that's retired from that. If you want to be a school teacher, get around some school teachers. Get around somebody who's 60 years old that's retired and tell them, are you glad you did it? And glean from their knowledge because anything God is going to call you to do, it's likely somebody else has already done it. You know, I think about Elijah and Elisha. Man of God sat there called to follow Elisha. And, and, and Elijah said, I'll do it. I'm going to follow you. And, and he, he did everything that he could. And he hooked himself up with somebody that would mentor him. And when it was all said and done, he got a double portion of his ministry. The man that he picked and said, I wish I could be just like that man in the spirit. He ended up being twice as awesome and twice as great as him. So you need to watch who you hook yourself up with. Paul and Timothy. Man, Paul was an amazing man of God and discipled Timothy through letters and would visit him and spend time with him because he wanted Timothy to be the best pastor that he could be. When I was 20 years old, I went into the full-time ministry, and I was connected to a man named Hal Haltom. And this guy every day spent 30 minutes with me, sometimes an hour. Sometimes it would end up to two hours. We'd work out in the morning. They would go to work, and we had our, our time together. So we worked out for an hour. So it was an hour and a half by the time the day started. And he would always say for 15 minutes, what do you want to talk about? And I would talk. And then after that 15 minutes, he would say, this is what I want to talk about. And he would mold me and shape me and disciple me. And then we would go to lunch together. We spent so much time together. The first seven years I was in ministry, this man personally discipled me. And, you know, I found somebody that I wanted to be, be like, how many quarterbacks have you seen come out in the NFL that started that kind of struggled a little? Who's the best quarterbacks in the NFL? I'm just, you ain't got to say nothing. I'm going to say Aaron Rodgers. 
only undefeated team. Who did he sit under for three or four years? Brett Favre. You know, you can go back and look at Tom Brady. You know, Drew Bledsoe was good in his day before he went to Dallas. Um, Tom Brady sat under him for a while, and he learned. You know, go back to Steve Young. He sat under Joe Montana. He could have been traded, but he said, no, I want to stay here and learn from the best because when my time comes, I'm going to be ready. You know, you need to get yourself, you know, under somebody like that because catch this, successful people leave hints. And the majority of the time, if you ask somebody who's successful in life, they're going to tell you how they got successful. And you need to be around people. And the, the thing is, never, never be afraid to ask somebody for wisdom. Never be afraid to ask somebody for knowledge. You know, you need to get around people who's going to speak into your life. This, this, is, this is how I feel. Your life and your purpose and your dream is like a child. You've got to guard your dream. If somebody comes to harm your child, what are you going to do? You're going to fight them off. Ladies more so than men. You know, and they love their babies, and men love their babies, but we don't love our dream. We do not love the very reason we're on earth, the very thing that God has called us to. We will not fight for our dream. If you get around somebody who's damaging your dream, get away from them. Very simple. If, if you say they're my friend, no, they're not. If they were your friend, they wouldn't be damaging your dream. You need to get around people who speak life into your dream. You need to get around people who are going to be able to help you in life. There is nothing more encouraging to have a friend. You know, the Bible says iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friends. You need to get around people that's going to help you. If you get around anybody who's pulling you down, first of all, if, if, if you say they're a friend, they're not, because why would a friend hurt another friend? True? Why would you hurt anybody? So if anybody out, this is elementary, but if anybody out there ever gives you drugs or alcohol, why would that person be a friend if they're giving you something that could kill you? I had some friends one night. We were all hanging out, and they offered a bunch of people alcohol. Two of us walked away. Two of us accepted it. I lived. The other two guys died. And then the guy at the funeral was like, man, he was my best friend. And I, and I politely said, no, he's not. You know, you, you basically killed your best friend. So the thing is, you need to guard your dream because that's why you're here on earth. And get around people who are going to help you in life. Get around people who are successful. You know, I have people in my life that I'll talk to and say, hey, I want to have a better marriage. And I walk up to a man and say, tell me how you have a, a great marriage. I see people how they, they have amazing kids. And I say, you know, hey, how do you have such great kids? And I get around people and I care men out to lunch and I need help with my finances and I care for people to talk to me about finances because I want to be successful in life in every area of my life. So whenever I need somebody to speak into my life, you know, I find somebody who's successful in that field. If I want to know how to get bigger and stronger, I go talk to Big John. And I, I say, how, how can I get bigger and stronger? He says, lift more weights. He right. <laughs> You know, but the thing I want you to know is this. Ralph Neighbors says this. You're going to be the same person you are in five years besides the books that you read and the people that you let influence your life. Now think about that. And this is what you need. You need people who have been there, done that, and got the T-shirt. Because if people have not been there and they have not done that, when you get your T-shirt, they're going to want your T-shirt. You know, when I was younger, I used to rodeo, yee-haw. And my dad sent me to some camps and, and, and to, to stay with these guys for three or four days that were professionals. And, and when I got to a good level and I started winning all these awards, these guys who were already at that level, they didn't want anything from me. But the people who thought they were an influence in my life and they didn't have anything, when I got stuff, they wanted it because they hadn't been there to sell. So whatever area you're in in your life, you need to find some people who's going to help you get there. You know, w what does God want from you? You know, and... What is the last thing that he told you to do? Don't move until he moves. So many people move too quick and they mess up, and then you got to backtrack. Then you got to explain for the reason you're backtracking. Man, do not move until the Lord moves. And, and this is what I ask. So this is my daily prayer. I say, God, let your passion become my passion, and then I'm living up my passion. Man, five years ago, I was a sports fanatic. I could tell you every starting quarterback, wide receiver, running back in the NFL – I can't tell you nothing anymore. I don't care about it. I used to love playing softball every weekend. Love smashing that big white ball. I don't even care about softball anymore. And I can't tell you why. I care about God, my wife, my kids, the connection. Okay. And, you know, I, I, this is what I love. This is what I love. And God has taken so many things out of my heart because daily I say, God, I want your passion. I want your desires. So whenever I think, I'm thinking how you would think. You think through me that I honestly want to be alive 
that, that, you, that you can live through 100%. Because if I do anything out of the flesh, it's not of God. And why would I want that? And the most exciting thing, the highlight of my day, when I do like my walks at night, like at 9 and 10 o'clock, I look forward to those all day. It's late. I'm tired. But I love walking around my block. It's just amazing. You know, I got different guys. I got Kyle and Tanner and Jeff and Willie and Marshall and Big John. Different people come. We just walk around the block. And I, I love that stuff. That is so much more fun than any softball game, basketball game, golf, whatever. It's just spending time with people because that's God's heart is loving on other people, making a difference. Amen? Start doing it. It's good. And this is the thing about dreams. You know, that was a dream that God put in my heart because I can just imagine when God came down, the very first people, Adam and Eve, that what did he do with them? He walked. He walked with them in the garden. And I was like, Lord, you were discipling people, doing that, walking and talking, just fellowshipping with them. That's what I'm going to start doing. I started at the beginning. You walk through the garden. I ain't walking in no garden. But I walk around my block, so I started walking around my block. You know, and this is the thing. When God puts the passion in your heart, it's just, there's a grace upon it. Man, about a long time ago, I, I was selling cars. That's what I did. I rodeoed for a living, then a drunk driver hit me, ruined my career, and I sold cars for a year. And after that, the Lord put me in the ministry. I didn't like teenagers, like I said. God dropped that passion in my heart to where I would get up in the morning, I would pray for these young people, and I would weep, and I would cry because I wanted them to fulfill the call that he had on their life. And, you know, there was a time that I just, I, I was single, and I was just really serving God, and I really wasn't looking for a girl because I didn't want to look and, and be with the wrong one when the right one came along, you know. And I was just praying. And, you know, God put a dream in my heart one time to marry Autumn. And, man, I was like, yeah. All these single guys in town were talking about her. And they were talking about how pretty she was and how godly and anointed and how she discipled young girls. But they were too scared to ask her out. I'm like, I'm not scared. I'm not scared at all. So I went to my office and I picked up my phone. And I was going to call her. And about two hours later, I kept dialing her. I was scared. Dude. I was a lion. And I remember I, I called her and I said, hey, church I go to has a Christmas party. I, th I forgot what I said. Something like, I don't think I can come alone. Um, I, I need a date. And I was sweating profusely and I was nervous. And, and she said she would go. And, and on, okay, y'all have seen my wife. Look at me. <laughs> That's not supposed to happen. And I was just like, really? Okay. And, and so, you know, now we're married and about to have our third child. And it was a, a dream that God put in my heart to ask her out. And I was like, there is no way this hottie's about to go out with me at all. And then I married her, and I was just like, yeah. And I think that's the biggest accomplishment of my life. <laughs> and I just, I still wake up in the mornings and look at her. I'm like, Jesus, he's good. And, and the thing is, when I was, I remember I was going to this Assembly of God church, and I was like, my dream would be to work at this church. I love the pastor and, and, and a lot of the deacons. And I like the, I just like, I love this church. This would be a dream come true. And you know what? A year later, I was on staff. And I was like, God, that was in my heart. That was a dream. But there's no way. And then about seven years later, I remember I was praying. And I always preach this message. If you do anything in the world for God, what would it be? And then at the end of that message, I said, I want to work at Street Rock Incorporated. I want to travel in a tour bus, just preach and pray at these conferences and then have interns and travel all around America and the bus breakdown and fun stuff. And then we, we did that, and, Lord, the bus would break down like in Chicago and stuff. But, but we would travel around and do great things, had all these interns with us. And then I got a phone call, and they said, would you and your wife like to come work at Street Rock? I'm like, God, are you kidding me? That's exactly what I wanted to do. There's no way those folks would ever call me. They could call. And the, and the weird thing was this. That guy said, so many people applied for your job that I gave you, and you never even asked for it. And I said, well, God put it in my heart. And he said, don't say anything. Let them call you. And, you know, then we worked there for a while. Then we started to come home, and I said, God, I think Church on the Rock, don't take offense to this, anybody. Church on the Rock is the best church in Texarkana. I have always thought it would be so amazing to work there. And I would just love to work at that church. And so I set up a meeting with Pastor John Miller. And he said, so what would you like to do? And I said, well, you know what you do on Wednesday nights with the youth service? I would like to do that on another night with, like, college-age young adults. He goes, hmm, guess what my number one prayer is right now? I said, what? 
that we would start up a college age young adult service in a group and that God would bring somebody. And I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm here. And it was just like, that was a dream in my heart. So many times God has put dreams in my heart to do things. And in my carnal mind, I thought, there is no way I can do it. And you know what? The Lord gave me a dream the other day of something that we could do inside the connection. And I was like, God, there is no way we can do that. And, you know, I wasn't speaking doubt. I was just thinking. And then I met with this guy from Gateway. And he was just talking about the same thing that the Lord had put in my heart. And he just encouraged me. Then I talked to this 20s pastor in Longview that called me up out of the blue. And we were talking. And he was telling me the exact same thing that God put on my heart that was in his heart. And God's connecting me with different people. And I'm just like, God, you're going to do this. And in and, and the leadership meeting, pretty soon we're gonna, I'm going to reveal some things we're going to do. And it's going to be amazing. But every time God gives you a huge dream, it like the air sucked out of the room. You're like, He's like, with me, that's why I gave her the dream. But remember, whenever God gives you a dream, he's going to give you provision. And he's going to put people around you to accomplish the dreams. And here's something that I want you to know. Every person in here is young. You are very young. Man, don't ever get a job and never go to work. Don't. Go to your dream every day. Is that sinking in? I haven't went, every day, I, I get so excited at night. I wake up sometimes in the middle of the night thinking, oh, I cannot wait to get to church from the rock tomorrow. I mean, sometimes I'll come in early. Sometimes I'll, I'll stay here late. I love what I do for a living. I have never once dreaded coming to church on the rock to work or to have a job. In fact, the J word, we don't, let's, we don't say that, you know. And, you know, and I do differentiate with my kids. I said, we're going to church, and then we're going to work. So they don't think that we're always at church, you know. So I don't know if that made sense or not. When you have kids, it will. And so the thing is, go to your dream every day. What do you want to do? I know some people, they say, all I want to do is be a high school teacher. Every day you get to impact people. I know people who want to work in the, in the financial world or whatever you want to do. Do it. It is a joy. This is the saddest thing. I hear grown 45-year-old men say, yep, got a job fair at Red River this weekend. I'm going to go see if they'll give me something. And I'm like, okay, that's great. You're going to go to a job fair, walk up to some stranger and say, give me a job for 40 hours a week. I don't care. I'll do anything. Are you motivated for that for 40 hours a week? Does that get your blood pumping? Mine neither. But you're so young right now. You have a choice that you can do whatever God puts in your heart. Whatever he puts in your heart. Don't go home to your parents and say, I'm quitting my part-time job because Pastor Joe said never go to work. I didn't mean it like that. Don't, don't like get part of the video and cut it out. That will be bad. But the thing is this, is, this is what I did last week. I was praying in my personal prayer time, and I just said, God, what is the next big thing that you want me to do? And so clearly I heard the Lord speak, do what's in your heart. And I was like, wow, I got some big things in my heart that I want to do. And it was so simple, and it was so plain. But I think that works for a lot of people in here. Do what's in your heart. You know, God is, will speak things to your heart sometimes, and you're like, I don't know. And you talk yourself out of it. You talk yourself out of the dreams and the things that God has given you. You know, it says this in Joel 2 and 28 in Acts 2 and 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Every one of us got flesh, right? The Bible says he's going to pour his spirit out upon you. But the thing is, are you listening to the spirit? And then it goes on to say, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, which means you have the ability to speak what the Lord is saying to each other. And it says, your young men will see vision, and your old men shall dream dreams. You know, I, you can see visions, you can dream dreams, whatever. But when you get one from the Lord, it will radically alter your life forever. And this is what we're going to do tonight as the band comes. This is what I do sometimes. I'll, I'll find a place inside, outside, in a chair, on a couch, on my bed, and I'll say, God, I want to lay down for 20 minutes, and all I want to do is for you to dream through me. And I just lay down there, and I don't, some, sometimes I don't put worship music on. I don't do anything. And I just say, God, start dreaming through me. Which basically means this. In your age, in this geographical location, there is a dream that God wants. 
and he's looking for some person to speak that dream into. And when he speaks that dream into your life, then he wants you to carry it out. So who wants to carry God's dream? Who wants that passion? Who wants the very DNA from heaven to come down that will radically shape and alter your life? Now, I'm telling you, this can be a good thing, and it can be a scary thing. I've seen people that are driven in college a certain way, and the Lord steers them another way. I've seen people that's about to go into one major that they really didn't like, and the Lord speak to their heart in a major they knew nothing about, and now they're absolutely loving it. We did this about four years ago, and this, this young girl said, I was like, I started my freshman year of college, and I hated where I was going, but everybody told me I was supposed to go this direction. So in a night, we did a service similar to this, and she said, God dreamed through me. The Lord spoke to me something that I absolutely love to do. And he said, now go get a degree in it. And about once every six months, she'll send me a Facebook message and say, thank you. That night altered my life forever, and I love my life more than ever before because of what the Lord spoke to me in one moment. He can speak to your life and radically change you forever.